small scout disappeared. And they found him laying next to a tree with his pants down to his knees, frozen to death. But then in an adjacent river, in the middle of the river, they found all of his clothes stacked and folded on a rock. And they said, Dave, nobody on this group could figure out what happened to Morgan. He disappeared so quickly and so fast, nobody knows. These are not normal missing persons cases. These aren't cases where maybe somebody was depressed and wanted to fall out of society. These aren't water-related deaths. These aren't uh, issues where there's a possible kidnapping or murder by someone they know. Those are exclusionary issues that we have and we won't investigate. These are highly, highly unusual. So I thought I'd put a compilation video together of stories of people that go missing in mysterious circumstances. These people have been usually part of a group like hill walking or whatever, um, the tail end of the group and they've disappeared, sometimes with no trace at all. Sometimes their bodies have been found in really weird circumstances. Sometimes they're found alive and they have no recollection of what's happened. But these stories have generated some fascination over the years. David Polides, who does the Missing 411, have a look into his stuff. He's got some really interesting stories of people going missing in the national parks. Now it has grown past the national parks and he's actually looking at the worldwide phenomena. Is in Australia, a few other places, UK especially. Anyway, our first story we're going to start off with. And it looks to me like they're actually making a movie out of this called The Lighthouse. But the original story actually stems from three lighthouse keepers on a small isle in Scotland. Donald MacArthur, James Ducat and Thomas Marshall vanished from the lighthouse on Flannan Isle, one of the seven small islands near Lewis in December 1900. Their disappearance was reported by a passion ship when the lighthouse, which was normally visible for 24 mile in all weather, was unlit. The only clues were an upturned chair, unmade beds and a meal of cold meat and boiled potatoes which lay untouched on the table. Exactly 100 years after they disappeared, silence fell for one minute near Breeskleet, west of Lewis, in honour of the three men. Residents, community leaders and descendants of all three were joined by officials from the Northern Lighthouse Board, which regulates the Scottish coastline. Speculation and theories have abounded as to what took place on the isle on the night the men disappeared. The three keepers were at the end of a 14-day shift but had been prevented from leaving due to the bad weather. A log revealed there had been a storm the day before the disappearance. However, the final entry on December the 15th said that the storm had abated. Following the sighting of the unlit lighthouse, the SS Hesperies, a support ship, ventured onto the Flannan Isle to investigate. The island was deserted, the jetty was battered, and the rails were twisted. According to popular legend, three birds, either shags or cormorants, dived off the rocks as the SS Hesperes arrived at the jetty of the isle. Other myths that have persisted in the local communities include pirate raids, sea monsters and vengeance ghosts. The mystery captured the imagination of Phil Collins, the singer, who wrote the song about the disappearance of the men. The most credible theory is that the three men were swept out to sea by a freak wave. 
Alastair McCauley, a reporter with BBC Radio Nan, Gade Hill in Stornoway, who has been researching the incident, said, I have heard about a woman at Crowlista in Uig who had been hanging out her washing that on that day. She was said to have seen a massive wall of water coming from the west. She apparently ran back into the house as this large wave hit the shore. Her washing and washing line were said to have been swept away. On December 26, 1900, Captain Jim Harvey was supposed to bring relief to the lighthouse in the form of a fourth attendant, Joseph Moore. As he approached the island, he noted that there was something off, as the relief flag was not flying and no one was anxiously awaiting their arrival at the landing of Aileen Moore. He sounded the whistle and shot a flare to try and catch the lighthouse keeper's attention, but the island remained silent. Thus Moore was sent ashore to investigate. Upon entering the lighthouse, he immediately knew that something was wrong. Inside, he found that no fire was lit ward off the damp coldness, the beds were unused and the clocks had stopped. Moore became increasingly worried about his fellow keepers and returning with help he searched the lighthouse from top to bottom. He also checked and discovered that the light was in working order. When Moore returned to the ship he told the captain of the disappearance and what he encountered within the lighthouse. The captain ordered Moore to return to light the lamp Three volunteers offered to stay with Moor to provide an even more thorough search of the small island n the next morning. The captain headed to the nearest telegraph station on the island of Lewis, and there he sent a message to his employer, the secretary of the Northern Lighthouse Board in Edinburgh. A dreadful accident has happened at Flans. Before turning to the hypotheses of what may have caused the disappearance of the three men, some of the facts discovered in the search for the lighthouse keepers should be noted. All three of the men who vanished were experienced at their work, and Ducat had even been chosen as the lead keeper during the construction of the lighthouse. Ducat had lived on Aileen Moor for 14 months, so he was well aware of the possible weather conditions. Ducat and MacArthur were married men and Marshall was single. Ducat often told his family that the conditions at the highly exposed lighthouse on Aileen Moor were dangerous and he had to be persuaded to stay at his job. The construction of the lighthouse took four years, not the two that were planned for it, due to delays caused by rough seas around the Flannan Isles and harsh weather. In his report of the events, Moore stated that he had noted that the kitchen door was the only one he could open and enter the lighthouse. The outside gate was closed, the fire had not been lit for some days, and everything within the lighthouse was in proper order. When he searched the island with the volunteers, they noted that on the western landing there had been some storm damage at some point. The iron railings from the trolley tramway had started from their foundations and broken several places, and the box containing the mooring rope had vanished, despite having been firmly wedged into a crevasse and then anchored. Robert Muirhead, the superintendent in charge of the lighthouse, confirmed Moore's account, adding that the dishes had been washed and the kitchen cleaned. He also wrote that the crane platform above the western landing was fine, but that a boy had also disappeared. After he examined the ropes, he asserted that it was evident that the force of the sea pounding through the railings had, even at this great height, 33.5 metres, 110 foot above sea level, torn the lifebuoy off the rope. 
Muirhead saw that the morning's work on the lamp had been completed, but it had not been lit after that. Captain Harvey believed that the men went missing on the 20th of December. He based his claim on the stopped clocks and the great storm that took place all over the western coast on that day. The logbook had been completed by the lighthouse keepers until December 15th, around noon. In 1920, an American magazine published the following as the final entries. December the 12th, gale, north by northwest, sea last to fury, storm bound, 9pm, never seen such a storm, everything ship shape, ducat irritable, 12pm, storm still raging, wind steady, storm bound, cannot go out, ship passing sounded foghorn, could see lights of cabin, ducat quiet, MacArthur crying, December 13th, storm continued through the night, wind shifted west by north, Ducat quiet, MacArthur playing, 12th noon, grey daylight, me, Ducat and MacArthur prayed, December 15th, 1pm, storm ended, sea calm, God is over all. However, some have claimed these entries are just a sensational hoax. It is interesting to note that the keepers also supposedly skipped the entries for December 14th in these entries. Secondary sources of the time said that the weather on the 15th of December was calm. The captain of the Archer confirmed that the weather near the Flannan Isles was clear but stormy. Two of the men's coats were missing, but one, MacArthur's, remained on the peg beside the door. Albert Petrie, a normally pragmatic keeper from the mainland, expressed his own feelings. The Flans is a rock station. It's just, once you're there, it's like any other rock station. It's, but the thought of coming here, coming to the Flans, is pretty dreadful. It seems to have a bad sort of name throughout the service. Whenever anybody hears about they've gone to the Flans, it sort of sends a shock down the spine sort of thing. But uh, once you're here, as I say, it's just like any other rock station. Petrie was asked what he thought had happened so many years earlier. There's lots of funny, queer superstitions about the mystery. The, we've even heard it suggested that uh, foreign power a boat from a foreign power had landed and took the keepers away for what reason I don't know there could be much of a spy out here but and uh, it's even been suggested that a spaceship had picked them off another keeper had a more logical explanation sorts of ideas of what could have happened but uh, I think one thing sure nobody will come up with a definite answer now but it looks to me as if they had gone down to try and secure something down at the landing and uh, one got carried away by the sea and the rest sort of tried to save him and they got carried away. But uh, you hear all sorts of different opinions and different views of views of it, but I don't think anybody will ever come up with that. So what did happen to the lighthouse keepers to make them break protocol where all three of them left the lighthouse? Why did only two of them take their jackets? if it was such stormy weather. Plus, if they were swept out at sea, where are the bodies? They usually to swept inshore and they're usually found, but there was none. 
Anyway, our next story, I'm going to look into David Polides. He's got many fascinating story on the missing 411. He was a New York cop, retired, and started looking into these disappearance of strange, strange people going missing and turning up in some fascinating places, in some fascinating positions too. Let's have a look at this. I'm a former police officer, spent 20 years in California and municipal department there. And after I left, I started to do some research in a national park. And some two national park rangers knew me from other books I'd written. They were following me around. Uh, later on, I left the park, went back to my room. Independently, they each came back and went to the room, knocked on the door and said that they had something to tell me. And they knew who I was. They knew I had the investigative work I'd done in the past. And they said, uh, we have a story for you. And uh, what they had said was is that they had worked at other parks and they had worked other missing persons cases in those national parks. They eventually got together. They talked about, compared notes at the park that they were at. And they thought there were some peculiarities there that needed to be looked into. Namely, during a search, during that first seven to ten days that someone goes missing, there's a lot of publicity, there's a lot of press, there's a lot of people looking for the missing person. At the end of that seven to ten days, there's nothing. Everything stops. There's no follow-up. There's no investigation. There's essentially nothing more that happens. And when they looked into it, they thought that the locations that these people went missing were odd. Uh, many of them went missing in places that weren't deep in the woods, but uh, might have been fairly close to the center of the park or a populated area or a location where a lot of people should have seen what happened. Mm. And they, the more they looked into it and the more they tried to find out information, they were stymied themselves. They couldn't get some reports. They thought the whole thing was just strange. So I said I'd look into it. I left the park the next day, called a couple law enforcement friends. I said, this is what I heard. See if there's any validity to it. You know, later on, they called me back and said, wow, there's something here. There are a lot of disappearances, and there's not a lot of follow-up, and there's not a lot of information available. So the National Park Service has a contingent of National Park police officers, and they're all trained at the Federal Law Enforcement Training Center. They get outstanding training. It's a big department, and we knew that if we filed a series of Freedom of Information Act requests against the National Park Police, this could be a jump-off point for our investigation into these missing people. So the first thing I did was filed against them for a list of missing people, and within six weeks I get a notice back from them. An attorney calls me from the Park Service and says, why do you want the information? And I know from reading the Freedom of Information Act, they can't use the rationale behind why you make a request for determining if they're going to give you the information or not. Mm -hmm. And I told him that, and he said, no, 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 you're going to get the information. We just want to know why you're using it. And I said, uh, just doing some research. And the person then came back and said, well, we don't have any lists of missing people. And I said, well, wait a minute. You guys have a huge law enforcement group. I could go to any small to medium-sized law enforcement agency in the United States, walk into their chief's office, and within an hour, he would have a list of all the missing people in his jurisdiction. Now, you're telling me in your large jurisdiction, you don't have any lists of missing people. He said, no. Well, if you go onto the website of the National Park Service and you kind of look around there, they have a lot of lists. One of the more interesting ones is a list of all the movies made on National Park Service property. So they know the importance of keeping lists hmm. and the importance of keeping lists of missing people. And they chose not to give it to us. So I was a published author at the time and I used an exemption and I said, I want to use my exemption and I'd like to get the information from your agency. And I, if you don't have it like you claim, I want you to put the list together for me. So they get back to me later and they said, well, we, we did a little search and your books aren't in enough libraries to qualify for the exemption. Well, folks, there is no such qualifier. It says, if you are a published author, this qualifies, period. And I reminded them of that and they said, well, this is just an internal policy we have. So I said, not well, a law. okay, so let's just pretend that I want to pay for the information. How much are you going to charge me for a list 
of missing people from Yosemite National Park and then a list from your entire jurisdiction. He goes, we'll get back to you. They get back to me and they said, well, for a list from Yosemite National Park, it's going to cost you $34,000. And if you want a list from the entire National Park Service, it's going to cost you $1.4 million. Basically what we would do is pick an area where we would like to hike and explore. And so when we went along Big South Trail for the first time, gorgeous hike, beautiful, beautiful river. You know, this is really a wild area and, uh, and the reason why Gary and I so much enjoy hiking together. And then it was just coincidental that you know, we wound up in a rock field and said, you know, let's hike up the ridge. And I think it's about uh, a 2,000 foot hike up elevation to get to the top of it. But really remarkable country. Yeah, okay, well, pretty much it was like a, almost a scramble. Okay, so you're watching your feet and basically you just focused a few feet in front of your own feet so you don't, you know, twist the ankle and stuff. And that's when I saw the shoe. It was pretty pristine. It was like somebody had just took the foot right out of it, you know. It was so fresh, I thought like I would see a kid standing in front of me. Jesus. And what's your name? Jared. Give me that big smile with the dimples. It wasn't so much that he liked the Raiders. He loved silver and black. And when he saw the Raiders on TV one day, he's like, yeah, there's a silver and black team. I said, yeah, there is. That's my team, Dad. I'm like, okay. So he's a Raiders fan. My name is Jocelyn Adadero, and my brother Jared Adadero went missing in the Colorado mountains in 1999. As I was younger, my dad will tell me that I would tell him certain memories I had of the hike. As I got older, though, I couldn't even tell you what I told him back then. I, the only memory I have of the resort or that that whole time period is after Jared had disappeared. We were back at the resort in a room. I, can, I couldn't even tell you where. And my dad was kneeling on the ground crying and I was hugging him. I was attracted to the Poudre Canyon because, you know, the trees were beautiful. And you know there's stuff out there, but it's just interesting because you become part of the Poudre Canyon right there. It was approximately a 10-acre resort. It was small, but, you know, we kept busy. It was all about just being there. It was one of those situations where when you actually owned the little store there, we got up at 6 o'clock in the morning, and we closed at 11 o'clock at night. Not only did it take care of us, but how many people get the opportunity to be next to their kids 24-7? And I, that's what I really enjoyed about the canyon. There, there were only three of us. I mean, even though we had a family at the resort, we had people that worked for us, it was Jocelyn, Jared, and I. We knew that we were the family. The group decided they wanted to go to the trout farm, a uh, fishery, right, right around the corner, maybe about a mile and a half, two miles from the resort itself. Several of the people I knew quite well. So I, I gave permission for Jocelyn to go, not knowing that Jared would be saying, gee, Dad, if she can go, why can't I go too? He had his shoes on. He hate to tie his shoes, so I didn't make him tie his shoes. And he had like a beige color jacket. Have fun, okay? Don't get too close to the water. I let Jared go, and I assumed that's where they were going. Describe the trail. Moderate. Ups, downs. You could take a kid on it as long as you kept the kid in line and hung on to him. Because there were some areas where the ledges were only 24 inches wide and you had loose shale all the way down to the river. So and then there was rock fields. Being a moderate trail, it's pretty tough. It can if you're not in shape, it'll take take it out on you. The church group 
went up to the Big South Trail, they parked at the trailhead, and they started walking in on the trail. They started to separate or spread out as they walked in, some people faster and slower. Um, one adult with Jared's sister and Jared seemed to be out ahead of everybody else as Jared, as a three-year-old, is, is running and playing and having a good time. And I believe there was something 10 to 20 minutes worth of time that she lost track. Um, the adult realized I haven't seen him for a while. And when they went up to try to find him, they kept going thinking they would catch up, and they didn't catch up. It was reported that he spoke to some fishermen. And he asked if there were bears around. And he's alone at this point in time. At least they have an idea of, you know, roughly where he was last seen. I myself was cleaning some things and decided to uh, sit down and watch a football game. And I must have been watching for maybe 15 or 20 minutes and I slowly nodded off. Something's wrong. And they're like, Alan, we have to talk to you. Sure, you know, you know what, what's going on? And they said, um, uh, we had a problem with Jared. Well, what happened? Did he fall? Did he, you know, scrape his knee? Did he break his arm? What happened? And what they actually said to me was, he's okay. We just can't find him. At that moment, I realized I had to go up the road. We got in our cars and I was in my truck. And I'm like, well, where are we going? They said, it's about, I can't remember, 16, 15, 16 miles up the road. I'm like, are you serious? How'd you guys get up that far up the road? And the entire way up the road, I just kept beating myself in the chest like someone had stuck me with a sword. Just beating my chest and yelling and Sorry, little man. Yelling Jared's name. I'm sorry I let you go. Yelling, God, yelling for God to help me. Please help me find my son, Lord. Just yelling and screaming. I yelled and screamed in my truck all the way up the road. I, I don't even know how I got there. I drove that road probably twice as fast as anyone should even drive that road. And as I ran up that trail, I yelled and yelled and screamed his name and screamed Jared, screamed J-Rod. I called him J-Rod. I called him my little man. Um, call, I called every name I could trying to get a response from him. And I listened. And I'm not sure exactly how far we got up on the trail, but I stopped and I realized, oh my God, this is gonna be, this, this is not what I thought it was. I, I, I just can't get up here and find him. We're gonna be searching. We worked for solid eight days to begin with. Uh, and that was uh, 20, uh, 24 hours a day for eight days. It's important to keep visual contact at all times. Absolutely. We did. Uh, some night searching was limited to a certain extent, but we did always have people out in the field to uh, make noise so if somebody was out there and out, uh, Jared would have heard it, he would have maybe responded or went to him. It was very intense, uh, very media friendly. I mean, there was media, CNN, and so it became a real nationwide uh, episode. So that put a lot of stress on us and a lot of stress on the dogs. It was a situation to where people lost hope. It's like, we're not going to find him. You know, it's, this is one of those situations where he disappeared.
we had hiked the area a couple of times before and we had talked about uh, the mystery of Jared or Darrow, whether he had been swept downstream, abducted by a, uh, a mountain lion, or if there had been something more sinister than that. Uh, this time we went, decided to go off trail and we just walked right into it. And, uh, uh, and we knew right away that it was probably Jared out of Darrow's clothes. Not, no boy, way. That's a hard one. No uh, way. No way. I, Absolutely no way. Not all the way. No, I could see him going. See, he lived in the he's cabin a, in the Poudre. He's a three-year-old. There's no yeah. way. Yeah, I, there is I no way that would happen. Yeah. Yeah. Not all the way. I mean, it was a struggle for Gary and Eddie. Yeah. Yeah. Very rough terrain. There were canine alerts that would go that direction. Now, whether they were right at the scree field or before it, but they were at least alerting up that hill. That's why I'm reasonably certain we searched it because we, when a dog alerts like that, we're thinking, okay, something must be up there. Let's get up there and search for it. Um, but we never found anything. I think whatever's happening is beyond our understanding. And in a lot of these cases, search and rescue or the volunteers searching people have already gone over certain areas, not once, not twice, but even dozens of times. And then the child is found there maybe a year, maybe a few years later. When we had discovered the clothes and went back up there with some of the people involved in the search, you know, they were all scratching their heads like, you know, they had all been around uh, the area. Uh, my conclusion was an animal encounter uh, right at the beginning. And um, so um, I'm not sure officially what has really been released as a finality, uh, but um, it pretty much points to an animal encounter. And if a cat actually took him, which is what I believe, I believe happened, uh, the cat would have taken him someplace and, and buried him and with all of the activity that was going on, probably would have left because we would have scared it away and, and it would have came back later. I hear constantly about a mountain lion. Yet, when they tested Jared's clothing, there was no mountain lion hairs, no DNA, no blood, nothing on his clothing. This is actually what's left of the cranium after four different DNA tests. To, to think that I, I mean, I have a hard time comprehending this, but to think that I'm actually sitting here holding my son. But this is, this is what I have left of him. The clothing was sent to the CBI. The clothing was tested by the CBI. No mountain lion hairs, no blood, nothing on any of the articles of clothing. If a mountain lion would have attacked him, they go for the stomach area. And this jacket would have been in shreds. I've been told by several people, mountain lion experts in the works, this jacket would not have survived a mountain lion attack, period. These are the actual shoes. These are Jared's shoes that were found up on the mountain. I've been told by experts that they do not look like they've been in the wilderness for three and a half years. The other thing that's interesting about the shoes is you would think that if a mountain lion were dragging his body up a mountain and dragging him like this, you would see marks on his shoes and there are no marks there. You would think if he was dragging them this way up a mountain, not only would you see marks, but it would have pulled his shoes off way before the area where they found him. Jared's pants were found inside out. Um, when people first see this, they get terrified and they look at it and go, oh my gosh, what, what could have happened to him? There were birds and rodents and stuff literally pulling it apart using the material as nesting 
So you see this material everywhere. So it's not because something attacked him and ripped, ripped his leg mm -hmm. off. This is all due to um, rodents and birds. Yeah, we were relieved in, in one sense that uh, the mystery had been solved. My sense of it is that uh, Jared, Jared was abducted in the, in the boulder field by the mountain lion. The mountain lion grabbed him by his shoulder and went straight up the this, this side of this mountain. In one of the reports, the person says, well, the reason why you didn't find any DNA or blood or anything on Jared's clothing is because either he or something removed his clothing before he was attacked. Either Jared or something removed his clothing before he was attacked. And they go on to say that because there are so many hikers coming up, the mountain lion took Jared's body 500 feet up the, up the side of the cliff. Well, wait a second. I can buy all that, but I can't buy this. If something or someone took Jared's clothing off before he was attacked, that means his clothing wasn't with him when this thing carried him up the mountain. Jared's pants were found inside out, told by many mountain lion experts. Mountain lions don't pull clothing off of you, especially your pants, and leave them there on the mountain inside out. There's just too much. There are too many questions that don't have answers. And I feel strongly, my family and I feel strongly, that there is someone out there who knows a little bit more than we know. You know, when I get questioned about this from people who... I've put in multiple hours going through a lot of David's stories. A lot of them are very fascinating. There's not just children going missing, there's experienced hunters as well. And these people are turning up in the weirdest of places. There was one hunter went missing a few feet, had a GPS, a compound bow, and he turned up with his clothes at the other side of the river bank, him deceased under a tree, but with the soles of his feet right down to the bone. There's been other kids went missing, found in places they shouldn't have been able to get to. And it's been said that as if they've been dropped from a great height and they still had some of their clothes on, but their bones were inside their clothes as if they had been dropped. Really weird. Well, David's got two documentaries out and many books. And if you scab, go through YouTube, you'll see that there's a lot of people speaking about this. Some of the stories are very fascinating. I would encourage you to have a look yourself. One place that's surrounded in UFO lore is Holloman Air Force Base in New Mexico. You've probably heard the stories of President Eisenhower apparently making a treaty with aliens to allow them to abduct humans, but only if they return them safe. Well, as far as I know, that treaty was broken but there's a lot more other stories out there, including this one, where a sergeant was abducted. In March 1956, in White Sands, New Mexico, near Holloman Air Force Base, Major Cunningham and Sergeant Lovett were out in a field downrange from the launch sites looking for debris from a missile test when Sergeant Lovett went over the ridge of a small sand dune and was out of sight for a time. Major Cunningham heard Sergeant Lovett scream in what was described as terror or agony. The Major, thinking Lovett had been bitten by a snake or something, ran over the crest of the dune and saw Sergeant Lovett being dragged in what appeared to him and was described as being a silver disc-like object which hovered in the air approximately 15 to 20 feet. Major Cunningham described what appeared to be a long snake-like object which was wrapped around the sergeant's legs and which dragged him into the craft. Major Cunningham admittedly froze as the sergeant was dragged inside the disc and observed the disc going up to the sky very quickly. Major Cunningham got on the Jeep radio and reported the incident to Missile Control, whereupon Missile Control confirmed a radar sighting. 
Search parties went into the desert looking for Sergeant Lovitz. Major Cunningham's report was taken and he was admitted to the White Sands Base Dispensary for observation. The search for Sergeant Lovett continues for three days, at the end of which his nude body was found approximately 10 miles downrange. The body had been mutilated, the tongue had been removed from the lower position of the jaw, an incision had been made just under the tip of the chin and extended all the way back to the esophagus and larynx. He had been emasculated and his eyes had been removed. Also, his anus had been removed. Comments in the report on the apparent surgical skill of the removal of these items, including his genitalia. The report commented that the anus and the genitalia had been removed as through a plug, which in the case of the anus extended all the way to the colon. There was no sign of blood within the system. The initial autopsy report confirmed that the system had been completely drained of blood and that there was no vascular collapse due to death by bleeding. Subcomment was added that this was unusual because in anybody who dies of bleeding or in the case of a complete blood loss, there is always vascular collapse. So for this last story, we're going to go back to Scotland and it's a place that's not too far from where I live. This is the story of Robert Taylor. In November 1979, when 61-year-old Robert Taylor was walking through woodlands near Livingston in central Scotland, the last thing he expected to see was a UFO. Whatever he encountered, he claimed he was attacked by it and left unconscious. According to Taylor's testimony, when he came to, the UFO was nowhere to be seen. But he claimed the air was full of a choking gas. In a daze, Taylor stumbled back to his house and called the police. When they arrived, they discovered the forestry worker battered and bruised with torn clothing. It's gone down in history, this case has been the only example of um, a police investigation into a suspicious attack by a UFO on an individual. Robert Taylor was the only witness to the events he described. But his account was judged to be reliable. Everybody who's invested the case says Bob Taylor himself was a very credible witness. Uh, he didn't try to make money out of the case. He was very phlegmatic about it and not, didn't seem particularly perturbed or excited about it. And he was not somebody who was known for making up stories or making incredible claims. He believed, and he always to his dying day, he believed that he saw a spaceship. For want of a better word, in fact, that's the words he used. He saw a spaceship. Unlike many UFO sightings, Taylor's eyewitness statement was supported by physical evidence. When the police visited the clearing where Taylor claimed he was attacked, they found the ground scarred with strange indentations. On examining the area, I found two track marks in approximately 40 holes in the ground. Since then, I've photographed the holes. You can actually see the trade marks which correspond to the marks here. This is the area in question where Robert Taylor said he saw that this, this fantastic object. This area here, we have over 40 holes in the grass and in the middle of this sloping field at the time were these track-like marks. Really baffling stuff because there was no tracks actually running to the clearing or running away from it. With the testimony of Robert Taylor, with these spiky balls that descended from beneath this object and rolled across the grass, perhaps it was that, those devices, it may have made these indentations, these marks in the grass. The police photographs and sketches are not the only evidence that remains from the incident. What I'm holding here is the actual trousers that Robert Taylor wore on that eventful morning, and they clearly show 
the rips on the trousers here. We have quite a substantial rip on the right leg of the trouser. And also, if we turn the trousers round to this side, on the left leg, we have quite a more substantial tear, as we can see here. Now, the testimony was that these rips were made by these sea mine devices. It fell from beneath the object that Robert Taylor saw on that eventful morning. The marks that you're looking at could have been made by something not of this world. It was a huge thing with a big round dome, a very dark grey colour, and it had a, a big flange going all the way around. I could see Aram's sticking out of this flange with what I took to be blades on the top. Later he described what he'd seen to a local newspaper artist who drew this sketch. As I stood here, there was two balls came out, two balls, I think they'd be about three feet in diameter with about six spikes. And they were rolling on these spikes. They came right up beside me and I remember feeling a tug at that time, and a very powerful smell, a choking sort of smell, and that was it. He crawled up this path and staggered home to be met on the doorstep by his bewildered wife. He looked terrible when he came in the door, and he just stood at the door, and I said, have you had an accident with your lorry? And he said, no. I've been attacked. And I said, what with? And he said, a spaceship. And I said, oh, goodness me, there's no such a thing as a spaceship. I'm going to phone the doctor. You must have fell and hurt your head. He looked quite shocked. And he, he was drained. He was right white. And his face was dirty. And he had a red scar here. And uh, his clothes were all dirty in his trousers. And then he told me his trousers had been torn. Justice and Barkhead. The police were called and they discovered inexplicable track marks at the scene of the incident. On examining the area, I found two track marks in approximately 40 holes in the ground. And these are the track marks here, and these are the 40 holes. Uh, since then, I've photographed the holes. This is a photograph of the hole here. This is a hole that measured approximately three and a half inches. And this other photograph here, you can actually see the trade marks which correspond to the marks here. These markings and tracks were actually inside this area here that's fenced off. Uh, and there's definitely no other tracks leading to or from this area. These are the trousers worn by Mr. Taylor. As you can see, they're of fairly heavy material. We have a tear on the left, just below the pocket, and one on the right trouser leg, again just below the pocket. These marks are consistent with the material having been pulled up while the trousers were being worn. Well, I'm pretty certain that that day that I saw a spaceship sitting here. We must accept the story of Mr. Taylor. He is a very highly respected member of the community, a man of high integrity, and not one likely to invent such a story. That was just a few stories of the strange abductions that have happened all over the world. There are many more. Just have a look on YouTube. David Pallides himself has many fascinating stories of weird disappearances. But as always, if you like my work, please share and like and consider joining my Patreon. It would help a lot. See you on the next one.